Today I'm joined by my friend Elbridge Colby. Thanks for uh, coming up to ISI. Delighted to be here. So Elbridge um, is the author of Strategy of Denial. He was the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Defense in the Trump administration and also a principal architect of the uh, the National Security Strategy. What's the official title? The National Defense Strategy. The National <laughs> Defense Strategy. Okay. Uh, which was published in 2018. Um, so thanks so much for joining. Great to be here, Johnny. So tell me about your own career and, and background. How did you get involved with uh, national security work? Well, you know, it's interesting. I'd actually, uh, I'd always had an interest, but when I was in school, including even into college, I, I sort of, I kind of think I had kind of had the idea that I was going to going to do foreign policy and national security something. Um, so I actually spent, instead of getting really early into it, I sort of had the idea in my head that um, I would use the time, uh, you know, in high school and college more for like a classical liberal education. Okay. Um, Did and, you major in history? Yeah, I majored or? in history, but it was a lot of it was like pre-1789, pre even like medieval and ancient history. And I did a lot of political and moral theory. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it was a history degree, but a lot of it was kind of intellectual history and history degree kind of gave me more um, uh, flexibility in a way. Uh, and, you know, I took pl classes with, you know, Harvey Mansfield and uh, although I'm not Australian, but a uh, big, big admirer of his. But that kind of so it sort of focused on on that. And then uh, as I got later into my college career, I started to do more on on national security and Cold War history and stuff. And then and then I went I went into. Uh, government for about four years um, uh, after I graduated from college uh, in the period sort of right after 9-11 during okay. the buildup to the Iraq war and you know at a very junior level but it gave me sort of a um, I guess not a bird's eye view probably like more of a peanut gallery view of of you know a, a pretty historic time not in a great not in a good way on multiple levels but um you know did that kind of working as sort of a junior staffer I had a couple uh you know, was fortunate to have a couple of very interesting opportunities. I worked on the commission that looked at why the Iraq intelligence was wrong as a staffer, and I was working for the first director of national intelligence as a staffer, but, you know, more at the kind of working level. And then I went to law school thinking that I, I might sort of do the old-fashioned, like, practice law and national security, but, but kind of pretty quickly realized that, A, I was not going to be a good lawyer. I was not interested. You know, my main legal advice is don't take legal advice from me. Um, and then, and that, you know, kind of followed my, my real uh, passion or vocation, if you will, uh, which was thinking more about, about national security and particularly kind of um, more where I felt that I was going to plug into it, which was in more of this strategy and kind of uh, conceptual level okay. as opposed to, um, you know, an operator or like a kind of a, a full-time, you know, kind of career staffer. I think there are a couple different ways that people can pursue uh, careers in, in the government and national security, obviously simplifying it. But, you know, there are people who are excellent staffers who are the best best guy or, or girl for or woman for, you know, staffing a principal. And that's incredibly important. And, and any, you know, even I remember a friend of mine once saying that Bob Gates walking away from a phone call with President Bush and saying, we're all staffers. So, you know, you, you got to be, staffing is important. And that's a kind of, Jack of all trades sort of uh, dynamic. Um, you know, you can also be a kind of you know, frontline person in the military or the mm -hmm. CIA or the State Department where you're meeting with people. Um, my mine is sort of the more the st strategist or you know strategic debate okay. and what's the right debate. And that I think to the extent that they are skills that those those are sort of the, the most um, compatible with my skills. And I you know I always feel like you should never compete with somebody uh, who enjoy, you know, thinks about this stuff on a run or in the shower, sure. you know what I mean? And that's sort of my thing. And then I think also in the last, increasingly in the last few years, but certainly going back to the Iraq period, the strategic debate is important in a way mm -hmm. that it, it wasn't necessarily, say, in the 1990s. So that's sort of been, and then I've kind of continued in that trajectory, um, mostly out of government for you know various reasons, but the background condition being the Democrats unfortunately dominating uh, the presidency for most of that time. Um, uh, but you know I think there are ways to contribute to the the debate and the discussion that shapes you know what government policy is, is looking like mm. over time. And did you feel that the kind of the liberal arts background mm 
does that play, you know, has that really helped you in terms of your thinking? Yeah, I think, I actually strategy? think so. I mean, I think it's, you know, it, worth it in and of itself, you know, the kind of Cardinal Newman sort of view, um, classical education view. But, but I also think actually because, um, you know, one of my critiques of the foreign policy establishment is that it's probably overly technocratic. Mm -hmm. It's, it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's fitted into, uh, you know, tech, sort of technical or particular areas of expertise that are valuable, but don't really give you the, the I would say, the detachment or training to evaluate mm -hmm. the kind of, or mindset to evaluate the whole thing and see it in perspective historically, um, you know, with the vantage of other kind of that, that liberal education that gives somebody more of a, you know, at least an, a, a, an exposure to and a receptivity and engagement with, you know, the, the kind of broader thinking of life. And I think that's, I think that's very important. I mean, what is it that America should do? I mean, a lot of, for instance, the, 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 the way people use, say, history um, is really pinched and kind of like almost sophomoric, you know, it's yeah. just this kind of cartoonish version of history. And not that history provides like, uh, you know, clear lessons one way or the other, but it provide. I, I think at, at its best, the history and, you know, the arts and so forth, they provide a, a depth uh, and a sort of a, a vantage that somebody who's purely kind of a lever puller in, in the technical sense, as important as that is, doesn't quite have that mm -hmm. vantage. And at what point did you see, you know, because obviously you, you came up through, you know, very mainstream yeah. elite institutions. Yeah. Um, so at what point did you see your... Um, kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I'd say heterodox, but yeah. your kind of distinct perspective veering apart from your peers. Well, probably <laughs> for my whole, I mean, I, my, I was joking with my, who's that, my uncle who remembers this, but I sort of like uh, just decided at the age of 13 or 14 that I needed to like learn about great books and philosophy for okay. reasons that are kind of mysterious to me, honestly. And sort of a misspent adolescence, honestly, relative probably uh, to having having fun and so forth. But I, I, I think I've always had a, um, I mean, not, it sounds a little ridiculous, but sort of a maverick mindset. And I'm actually try I try to be conscious of it that it's not, doesn't take on its own, um, a life of its own where you're trying, like, I don't think one should be contrarian. You know, I think being, uh, you know, being able to think for yourself and on your own is, is good. But I, I, I try to balance that against myself. But I, you know, even back into the 1990s, I, for instance, on foreign policy, I remember being um, of a different view hmm. on like the Kosovo intervention. Oh, really? So okay. I was already kind of drawn in that direction. And that that was true in the in the Iraq war lead up again. Not that I played any significant role in that, but just my own views. Um and I think, um, you know, I mean, even the idea of like studying and being engaging with like the classical tradition and the Christian tradition, it's are, are, are itself sort of countercultural. Sure. You know, I mean, I think they're right anyway, but um, maybe that, I, in some sense, like, I guess something to say about the liberal arts and how it relates practically, and maybe for people who are thinking about that you know, um, to make it a little more concrete. I think, you know, for instance, someone like me, I take a lot of flack for my positions on national security, but I feel like one of the things, for instance, a lot of the people who are in the in my field and some of the reaction to me, I, as far as I can ascertain, some of it's just, you know, disagreements mm -hmm. is fine, but a, a lot of the sort of the vehemence, it, it's like this NATSEC community. Okay. Um, which is fine, but like I don't identify as a member of like the NATSEC community. Yeah. Like my, I, I have like a liberal arts education, not, not perfect, obviously, far from it. But it, that's like my source. That's like my self identification. Yeah. Where their identity is really anchored. To it's being really part anchored, of this community. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that I think is okay in a situation where the status quo is fine and yeah. inertia is fine. But that's not the situation we're in. Sure. And I think it's important for people who are going to be future leaders, certainly conservative leaders, or if they're going to think in ways that are more realistic, they've got to be prepared mm -hmm. for taking a different perspective. And also, you know, sort of where is their source of intellectual and moral uh, confidence, you know, well-grounded well confidence. And I, I don't think that you're going to find that just by reading like the latest textbook on IR theory, Yeah, as important as that for is. Sure.
What now? What about the role of uh, you know? I guess social media. I mean, you're very active yeah. on social media, and also have kind of you know um, branded yourself. It's, you're, you're an ideas entrepreneur as you're yeah. thinking about strategy. Right. Uh, is that um, in it? And I it you know appears to have served you well. I mean, there are. Is that is that I guess pretty common in the the net sex yeah. space, or do most people just kind of keep their head down and just. I you think know, there's not different. Say too much. I mean, I think my view on social media is that um, so there's a lot of particularly kind of conservatives or sort of more old fashioned type people who are sort of dismissive of it. And I think that I, I try to look at it as an, an instrument, mm-hmm. um, which is to your point about an ideas entrepreneur. Like I fundamentally and I was saying this in an interview a couple months ago, like I don't know what's going to happen to me in 2024. 2028, 2032. I mean, I would, I would, I, I would hope I would have the chance to serve in government again, mm-hmm. but you, you never can count sure. on it. And to me, given what I was talking about in terms of my, um, you know, my my focus on uh, strategy and strategic, you know, focus and so and so forth, the main thing I want to do is try to change, you know, so the way we think about mm-hmm. the strategic interests, reinjecting conservative uh, realism and particularly kind of a conservative inflected realism into our debate and then in more concretely kind of refocus our our foreign policy towards uh you know asia and military mm-hmm. balance and a realistic uh, goals etc so to me um you know first and foremost i want to use the tools that are available sure and um so i wrote a book i do podcasts yeah. and, and video interviews and i go on tv and i go on radio and i do interviews and i use social media and social media has huge risks, which is that you say something in a fit of peak or whatever that's dumb and you light yourself on fire. Also, there's a, people really behave in a very, many people behave in a very, very nasty way in social media. So it can, it can just like kind of drag you down a bit. But, uh, but on the other hand, it's an incredible tool hmm. uh, to communicate and people oh, yeah. read it, including in government. So you don't always see the engagement sure. that's actually happening, especially in governments. But like, you know, I'll regularly have like foreign officials come. Well, I know what you think because I see what you're saying on social media. And it's like, well, yeah. okay, great. You yeah. know, so like I, obviously from an idea impact perspective, sure. that's great. And the other thing is to me, and this is a positive thing and is, is part of my approach towards it, is it's more sort of small d democratic mm-hmm. in the sense that like a fundamental point of what I'm trying to do is overhaul, try to contribute to overhauling our establishment. I mean, the word establishment is not great because it's not, it doesn't really accurately reflect that. maybe the system or as Ben Rhodes called it, the blob. Like, I don't think the foreign policy elite establishment has done a good job over the last three to 35 years. And I actually think that the more rooted our foreign policy is in the kind of pragmatic attitude that probably most Americans have mm-hmm. and people around the world, it's actually going to be better. Yeah. And my own arguments will be better if they're not you know, so somebody was saying to me recently, he was comparing some of what we're kind of doing, a number of us, to like the Federalist Society. And, you know, back in the old days, that a part of it was making the Republican, I mean, right of center, whatever you want to call it, judicial, com- legal conversation more connected to like what people actually want. You know, Bill Buckley's famous yeah. comment about the nine people out of the Boston phone book. And I think there's something a, a bit different. And, and I sometimes go, ah, you're too active on Twitter. And I'm thinking to myself, well, a, it shows, I think, first of all, I get the benefit of, I'm rarely surprised because mm. <laughs> I've probably heard the critique somewhere before, you know, so it helps me. And I think it shows an openness yeah, and hopefully a kind of democratic, small d, honesty about what I'm trying to say. So like, and you can see it. And also it's an incredible um, way of saying exactly what you want when you want. And, the, mm. and that's a real problem because for people... I think of my my point of view. I think we are in the ascendancy. I think momentum is with us, but the commanding heights of elite media are definitely not. Mm. E- even on the supposedly right of center side. I mean, look at the Wall Street Journal op-ed page. Definitely not on the same page. The Washington Post. I mean, even the New York Times might even be more open in some ways. Sure. You know. So if 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 I were reduced to the op-ed pages and like formal media, that's then. I don't think we would have been able the to have the impact. Yeah, the message. Yeah, yeah. And I, but I would say for, I think people should treat it with caution because, like, sort of once you go there, it's, you can't kind of go back. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually, I'm, I'm a really big fan of it. Yeah, you know, that's great. So, so in the beginning of your book, you talk about mm-hmm. a distinction between defense strategy and yeah. brand strategy. Uh-huh. What, what is that? difference yeah i think um i I kind of put three layers in my book so so grand strategy is like 
everything on the table, kitchen, mm-hmm. you know, the whole kitchen sink or whatever, you know, military stuff, but economics, diplomatic relationships, okay. et cetera. That's like orienting the state. And, and, and the strategy that the government puts out that's supposed to deal with that is what's called the National Security Strategy, which is released by, appropriately enough by the White House. Defense strategy is, um, and, and I'll distinguish it from military strategy, which I think might be a little more um, uh, kind of intuitive. Okay. Military strategy is like the level of like, how would you fight a war? Mm-hmm. You know, how do you actually use the weapons and so forth that we have to defeat an enemy? So like the military strategy in against Germany for the United States in World War II was we're going to bomb them, bomb them, bomb them. Then we're going to kick them out of North Africa. We're going to go into Italy. And then eventually we're going to like take them down directly in Normandy okay. and go, go into Germany. Defense strategy is sort of a level above that between grand strategy and... Um, uh, military strategy it, because it's particularly about like especially over time how you use industry mm-hmm. how you develop alliances uh, how you use your kind of the political goals that you're talking about etc to you know achieve obviously the goals of the of the uh, uh, of the grand strategy but also to create the conditions for the military strategy so like you know you may want a military strategy of um we're going to invade Europe in, in Northern Europe in 1944, but your defense strategy is also going to be like, well, the Soviets are going to come over here and we're going to have an industrial base that's this and all these kind of uh, enabling uh, conditions. And that's the level in particular where civilians become very important, but also civilians are also very important at, at the level of military strategy because in a world in which you have nuclear weapons, mm-hmm. you have other uh, we- uh, very, very destructive weaponry where I- industry is so important, that act, and military officers have to be involved up into the level of defense and even grand strategy as well. So it's more of a of a discussion. And I think the reality is that our defense strategy right now, that the, the defense strategy on the books is a good one because mm-hmm. the the Biden team basically continued okay. the defense strategy that, that the Trump administration put out in 2018. But what we're actually pursuing doesn't make a lot of sense. We're not building up a defense industry mm-hmm. to sustain it. We have overly ambitious goals in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And then we have a, a military that's constrained that we're acting as if we can be dominant in three theaters. And that, you know, we may not be, we may not be co- uh, sort of con- admitting that we ha- are making choices, mm-hmm. but we are making choices. Okay. And so, and you would, you know, identify as a realist to some extent. Yeah. What, is, what is the relationship between ideals and realism? Can a realist still have ideals? How yeah. does that in a form? Absolutely. Inform I mean, it? I would say realism is not only the, the probably the least bad way of looking at the world or the least defective way of looking at the world, especially looking at the behavior of major states, especially in, in fundamental decisions of war and peace. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would say realism is actually, the kind of realism that I'm advocating for is more moral than idealism. Okay. Because... Um, it's basically the diff- difference between pure intentionality and a reasonable conception of what the consequences of your behavior are. Mm-hmm. And I wrote a piece in First Things a couple of years ago about the morality of a strategy of denial, kind of making this case. And I would just say, for instance, you know, I mean, President Trump was talking um, in September about how s- terrible the situation in Ukraine is and, and the war is not going well. And I think that's correct. Like, I think we would have been better off... At, um, uh, being having a realistic assessment of how resolute the Russians were, how capable the Ukrainians are, and how prepared the United States and its European allies are to support mm-hmm. the Ukrainians and calibrate based, and then what we could realistically negotiate over, for instance, NATO uh, uh, membership for Ukraine, which I don't think makes sense anyway, and yet mm-hmm. we're refusing to negotiate over it. Whereas the, ideal, the idealistic point represented by, say, President Biden or you know, Secretary of State Tony Blinken their intentions may be good, sure, but the results are very Terrible. bad, and they're yeah. reasonably anticipatable. And I would say I would apply the same framework in, in fairness to say George, President George W. Bush. I never thought President Bush was uh, deliberately deceiving the American people, mm-hmm. or or ha- you know was going into Iraq just to exploit the oil or something for Halliburton. No, I thought he had good intentions, but I think the results were bad. And so what I what I think conservative realism is about. And realism, you know, in general, is about saying, especially a moral reason. It's not like the, you know, the, the you could say the German term "Machtpolitik," sort of force politic of like aggressive, you know, um, uh, you know, amoral mm-hmm. uh, sort of aggressiveness. It's about what can we realistically achieve 
-hmm. and let's make the best of that situation. Okay. Trying to avoid wars, for instance, if possible, but being prepared to fight them. Um, and I think, I think that's actually more moral uh, than, um, than idealism. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I guess, so if you're looking at kind of the course of American history, um, you know, obviously America's kind of, uh, you know, footprint in the world has, you know, drastically Just, expanded, right, 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 from 13 colonies right. to kind of slowly, um, you know, expanding the Republic to the right. continental United States to, you know, Hawaii and, and the Philippines mm -hmm. and, you know, you know it slowly expanded. Right. And then through the various world wars, Cold War, mm -hmm. we arrive at the unipolar moment. Right. We're sort of the last man standing, right? Um, <laughs> for now. Uh, for now. For that. For that, yeah. for that, yeah. for that yeah. moment, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, so is there, I guess, within the logic of, of, of realism, like, is there ever kind of like an ideal end game? Or is it is it just always... Um, well, you know, I don't know. We're, we're the unipolar, you know, we're the global hegemon. And so, I don't know, do we keep that as long as we can? But then when it doesn't work, then do we, I guess it's hard for me to figure out because I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the yeah. realism. And I think this is the point. It's easy to say, okay, we've, the, the U.S. has done too much, you know, right. or Iraq was a mistake right. or we, whatever, pushed too hard in the Eastern Bloc and now we're in this situation with Russia. But, it, but it's always hard kind of when, you, when then people ask, all right, so then what is your, if you're, you're yeah. going to say unipolar moments over, what is the, what are we working towards? Right. Well, I think so. I mean, I think as, and I think for conservatives, this should be pretty, uh, people should be pretty receptive, which is that there, there's no true end to um, uh, competition and rivalry. And, and the, the kind of model that I actually think the constitutional model mm. is itself a representation of that idea, which is that the core idea, Bill Barr said this in a speech when he was AG that I thought was exactly right. The core of the American system structurally is the constitution, mm -hmm. not, uh, not the Bill of Rights. Not that the Bill of Rights aren't important, but sure. the core idea is the separation of powers, mm -hmm. which is to say there's always going to be power and power is going to be exercised and it's going to be adapted. The key is to make sure that nobody can agglomerate so much mm -hmm. power against our interests that they abuse it. Um, and so, um, you know, I mean, there's a different issue about the end of history and the specifics of like the Koyev and, and Fukuyama's argument. I don't think Fukuyama in the last few years has um, been as interesting and nuanced mm -hmm. as he was before that. But, um, but I would say that, I mean, to me, I think that, that you know, there will always be uh, a balance and or, or sort of um, there will always be strategic rivalries and dynamics the, the key is to ensure that we are sufficiently strong ourselves mm -hmm. but also in concert with others that we can achieve what we need and, and I think having a clear idea of what our goals are sure. a reasonable conception of our goals and that get, gets back to another thing about why realism is more moral than idealism is that our our goals are reasonable, I think, the goals and what I try to lay out in my book, which is, of course, always sort of vague and subjective and dynamic and so forth, but are basically, obviously, our physical security, but also, you know, our growing prosperity and interlinked is our freedom, right? Mm -hmm. our essentially, our ability to, 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 to forge our own future. And, you know, we'll have our own fights about the social media companies or what have you, you know, exactly the parameters of political speech and so forth. I mean, I'm very for free speech, but that's something that we can decide ourselves. So I think, I think that that's basically a balance of power in the world mm -hmm. and a balance of power in which we are sufficiently strong not to be coerced. That's like the metric. Yep. And so that like will always be never final or fixed, but that's good because that's, it's never going to happen or it's a more realistic sure. goal. And what I would say just on the, on the point about American history is I actually think this way of thinking is very consistent mm -hmm. with America, the American tradition. That actually the last generation, if anything, has been the, the uh, aberration. Not to say that American foreign policy and policy has always been, you know, genius or anything. But if you go back, I mean, I think Washington's farewell address, and you, I think, probably know more, much more about it than I do, but just kind of thinking about it, reading it, it's basically a pragmatic ag admonition. You know, the entangling alliances point, which I have sympathy with, but I don't think Washington, first of all, we had alliances during the revolution, sure. right? Yeah, and yeah. we made, by the way, we made alliances with like absolutist France and I believe Spain, right? Yeah. So we were making, because we were like, well, we got to achieve this goal, and this is the help that's available, yep. right? And and I think at the time, the mindset of the first like hundred years of the Republic, or certainly to the, you know, or I guess to like the Spanish American War or something, was look like Europe is where power is concentrated. We don't have the ability to affect it, so we're going to kind of stay out of it. 
we're going to focus on maximizing our own power, mm -hmm. you know, taming and securing the continent, and then starting to project power into the Pacific. I mean, we were not isolationist. Yeah. In the in the Pacific, you know, we're Samoa, Hawaii. We opened Japan, trading in China, and so forth, and of course the Mexican War and these kinds of things. So to me, the the, the American mindset at its best is going to kind of like prudent and pragmatic, obviously always with the idea of promoting our republic and generally promoting, promoting republicanism elsewhere. But, you know, as John Quincy Adams famously said, let's not go seeking monsters to destroy. And I think, you know, I think pulling back after the inner warrior, in the inner warriors was a mistake, like mm -hmm. QED. I think if we would maintained something probably along the lines of what like Teddy Roosevelt and other Henry Cabot Lodge were talking about, as opposed to Wilson's unrealistic, yep. excessively idealistic collective security model, we all would have been better off because maybe the Germans would have been deterred, right? Sure. That would have been better for us and others. Um, but I think like the, the Cold War policy, and this is something that's very important, the, the, the sort of more idealistic, you know, American unipolarity hegemony people try to own the legacy of World War II and uh, the Cold War. But I think actually America, especially Republican presidents, were mm. quite realistic Sure. Um, you know, Reagan certainly was. Reagan, I mean, Reagan, let's, you know, Reagan, let's start with Reagan at the end. I mean, Reagan's rhetoric was um, often quite highfalutin, high, high level. But actually, if you look at the behavior of the Reagan administration, yeah. first of all, we only used the military twice, basically, in Grenada and in Lebanon. Partially, that was because it was post-Vietnam, but okay, that was how he can and. You know, he built up strength in the main theater, mm -hmm. Europe. Um, he he did actually, he, he was very critical of the Soviet Union, but then, and he was criticized for this, he was willing to engage with, uh, with Gorbachev when mm -hmm. he saw an opening. Um, so I think that that's one. And, and, you know, if you look at President Nixon, certainly opening to China, but also President Eisenhower, and you look back at Eisenhower in World War II, um, you know, did not intervene in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Did not intervene in Indochina in 1954. Cut defense spending after the Korean War. Ended the war in Korea. Um, not not because there was some like idea that we were going to have a you know big kumbaya with the Soviets, but like okay, what do we need to do? What are our advantages? What's realistic for us to achieve at a, at a cost the American people are willing to you know to bear? And I think that's the tradition that we want to tap back into. So people say, oh, you guys in in, in the you want to blow up the whole post war order, and I'm like, no, 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 I actually. I want to get rid of the post-Cold War order hmm. when we got high on our own supply yeah. and thought we could do everything. So what parts of the post-war uh, or the first one, the, you know, post-World War II order, yeah. would you keep in well, place? Well, I mean, I would, for instance, like NATO, like NATO, I would totally keep, I would recommend totally keeping, but make NATO fit for its, its time, sure. which is the Europeans who are totally capable uh, can take much more responsibility, which A, is totally possible and is consistent with the NATO treaty. But also if you go back to the way NATO was structured in the Cold War, the Europeans all had very serious militaries, the NATO Europeans, mm -hmm. the West Germans, the French, the British. British were spending above 5% in the 1980s. And by the way, even the Dutch, apparently the Belgians could put like 50,000 people in the field in the 1970s, right? So it's like, and by the way, we would give them a really hard time about this, ever since going back to the Lisbon Accords in 51 or 52, where the Europeans committed to building up their conventional militaries. Now, they never fully did it, but we were always holding their feet to the fire. Like LBJ did this during the balance of payments crisis, the Mansfield Amendment. This was always an issue. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower, Eisenhower, when he was sacked here, he said, if US forces aren't out of, out of Europe by the end of the 1950s, this is a failure. Now, we ended up evolving the position, but like the point was, and, and, and you, know, I was, you know, this idea that the, Europe, that the Americans are supposed to do everything and the Europeans are supposed to be dependencies, that would have been news to like Charles de Gaulle or Winston Churchill sure. or Conrad Adenauer or Alcide de Gasperi, these kind of leadership. You know, these, the, the European states were supposed to have strength and autonomy. And I think that's both their responsibility and I think it's a healthier basis mm -hmm. for an alliance going forward. The problem is, and this gets back to that establishment thing, there's after the Cold War, NATO turn, essentially went from like an unfashionable, very military focused alliance mm -hmm. to now like a fashionable, largely political, much less military alliance, okay. which is like the inverse of what we need. Yeah. So it's like expanded, but weakened militarily, other than the United States, basically, even us. Um, and, and the reason is it's not, it's not all or even maybe 
it's primarily the Europeans' fault. I mean, I think they share a lot of the blame. A lot of it is our foreign policy establishment mm-hmm. because the foreign policy establishment are the ones who want and benefit from American leadership. Like if you go to the Munich Security Conference, it, they are put on a pedestal. Yeah. And that's true of Republicans as well as Democrats, old kind of old style, you know, sort of 1990s, 2000s types of Republicans. And, but the people who are losing out on that are the American people, mm-hmm. both on like financial terms, but also like fighting all these wars and having way more responsibility than is fair. So, but Europeans are right when they say, hey, the Americans have been telling us for years that we don't need to do this stuff and now you're changing. And it's like, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, look at the critique we're making of the establishment. Yep. And that gets back to like the use of social media. One of the things I'm trying to do like in the last kind of couple of years is communicate to the Europeans that this is what's actually going to happen. So don't count on reassurances given to you by, you know, elite people. I mean, let's say I'm not, I'm not anti-elitist in like, there's always an elite. Sure. But I mean, the, the people at the Munich Security Conference saying, hey, don't worry, everything's fine. We're going to like double defense spending and the American people will always be there. And I'm like, that's not true. Yeah. And here's why that's structural as well as the political landscape and the fiscal landscape and the military landscape. And I think it's, I think it's actually having an effect. Yeah. I think the Europeans are starting to get it. Now, they're not responding as I would have. Yeah, to, but, but I, so in um, last March, yeah. I went to Rome yeah. and gave a book talk there and then mm. arranged some other meetings and went to the Italian Senate. Oh, and, cool. and basically, like, yeah. literally every, both both conservatives in the, Italian conservatives in the public policy space, yeah. but then also the uh, the members of their parliament that I met with, like, I literally couldn't talk to them for 30 seconds without them saying, oh, you know, we're going to get our defense spending up to <laughs> yeah. 4%. You know, it's like, we're yeah. at this percent yeah. now, and yeah. I, I promise we're going to get right. there. And it's just like, who am I? I mean, just, you know, I just run a think tank. No, but it's like, very important. they're just apologetic yeah. and like, we're on our way. They, right. The message you is received, see, exactly. you know, and they feel like yeah. they have to explain themselves. Right. Exactly, yeah. which is a different thing. I mean, thing. That's, exactly, yeah. that's a good thing. That's why I say, actually, that's why I think, um, I think exactly what you're talking about is a rebuttal of both isolationist and what I call primacists, mm. the sort of um, people who think we can do everything. Because the argument of both of them is that our allies are feckless freeloaders. Mm-hmm. The isolationists say our allies are feckless freeloaders and are gonna get us into wars, so we should withdraw because it's not worth it. Sure. But the primacists say our allies are feckless free- freeloaders who can't tie their own shoes, so America has to do everything. Yeah. That's not true. Sure. Not, it, it, actually, our allies, have been kind of some of them have been feckless freeloaders, <laughs> but they could do better. Yeah, and they have done better. Sure, you know, including the Italians. Like the Italians had a pretty formidable military back in the in the Cold War. You know, and they like they rationally the Germans and the Italians and others they rationally dismantled their militaries because it was really secure and they could always count on the Americans because of the world situation. So to me, I'm like, well, let's tell them the truth, which is that that doesn't hold any longer, and of course, Russia is a threat. So. You know, mm. give them warning. Yeah. So I want to get to China yeah. in just a second. Is there any prospect, maybe not tomorrow, but in five, ten years, of us pulling Russia back into the West yeah. and kind of instead of out of the arms of, of, of China? Of China. I mean, I think it's a highly unlikely prospect in the near to medium term. Okay. Um, I mean, just watching the Russians over the years. And, and from their point of view, their rational calculus, I think they don't believe such a rapprochement is even possible, let alone right. desirable. And now, where I agree with some of the people who say that the Russians think they are at war with the West, I think they kind of think of themselves as being in like a systemic struggle. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think that an offer, leaving aside whether we could even develop an offer that would be sufficiently attractive to sure. Russia, I don't, I, I don't think in the current situation. Um, they would even like believe yeah, it. Yeah. You know, they see themselves in a, as a separate civilizational yeah, block. Or, or they just? Yeah. I think they think that the United States and and the Europe. They, 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 my impression is they think the Americans are like pulling all the strings, and the Europeans are kind of like feckless, like and we'll do kind of what yeah. we want. And then we have these sort of like attack types, like the like Poland or something, or the Baltic states that they regard as our, you know, kind of a combination of our, like, cat's paw and also um, pulling us along. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and then, of course, there's this huge, incredibly costly war in Ukraine that, of course, has to shape their, I think it's, their invasion was evil and wrong. But, like, looking at it, again, realistically, that's their perspective, and they've committed a lot to it. And, and, you know, 
they regard China as having stuck by them in their hour of need. And yes, China's driving a hard bargain. But that all said, um, over time, um, a couple of things. One, you know, I think structurally they do risk becoming Mm -hmm. uh, essentially a kind of a dependency of, of China. And if the if there's something you can say about the Russian strategic mindset, it is that they want to preserve their autonomy. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, going, I guess going back to the Mongols, like they have not wanted to end up under the, somebody's aegis. And so that, that is likely to be an enduring and possibly like reasserting um, dynamic, especially if there's a leader who follows Putin, who is not going to be, I doubt would be dramatically different, but might want to, create a different course. And, you know, if you look at how Brezhnev differentiated himself from, from Khrushchev after the Cuban Missile Crisis, he pursued detente with the United mm-hmm. States as opposed to the more confrontational approach. That all seems plausible, especially if the war in Ukraine hopefully ends um, on reasonable terms. Uh, so I think there could be, and, and, you know, things change. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Mao Zedong, I mean, the idea of opening up to China was like something beyond yeah. the, the pale but Nixon was able to do it, but it takes somebody, it takes the right time mm-hmm. because the Soviets had started fighting. I mean, the Chinese and the Soviets actually were fighting this. The, the Chinese actually evacuated Beijing because they thought that the Soviets were going to nuke it. So you got to have, that's the kind of core thing is that there's a, you know, but that's that's very different from 10 or 15 years before. Sure. Um, uh, but I think, you know, and, and of course, you know, people say, well, how could we deal with the Russians? Well, we dealt with Mao, who's one of the worst people ever, and we... Dallas Stalin, who was also, I mean, when the Soviet Union was at its most evil, yeah. they were our ally in, in the Second World War. And I'm glad for it because I had like multiple family members in the European theater. I wouldn't be here yeah. if we had had to fight our way alone. We, I don't think we would have had the stomach for it, honestly, mm-hmm. based on like Max Hastings' writings and so forth. So to me, again, that's not saying that, of course, we, <laughs> we went right from being friends with Uncle Joe to saying you're our primary rival, which was the right thing. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, that's sort of my, my view on it, which is, you know, we should be open and prepared. And that imposes also a cost on the Chinese in the sense that they don't know that the, Rus- the more the Russians have an alternative, mm-hmm. uh, the more that causes problems uh, in the Sino-Russian relationship. Okay. But again, I'm not saying it's something we should do in the kind of near to medium term. I think we've got to, but we'll keep, you know, keep our eye open. Sure. So moving to China, I mean, you gave a, a talk recently on sort of prioritization, mm-hmm. you know, obviously putting the China threat uh, at the top of the list in a world of scarce resources. I'm wondering, I want to go deeper into yeah. kind of the argument in your book, but before that, there was a, an interesting panel recently um, at the All In Summit oh, between yeah. John Mearsheimer yeah. and Jeffrey Sachs okay. and David Sachs moderating. Right. Um, I, you know, I was curious, um, Mearsheimer was making this point that... Um, in his view, he, he kept saying that America is the only, only regional hegemon, mm-hmm. um, and that our goal when it comes to China should be to prevent them or right. to deny them from becoming a regional hegemon, breaking out of the you know island right. chain, because right. then they can roam you know right, the right. world right. And um, so I guess I, as I was listening to that, um, and, and Jeffrey Sachs disagreed with right. that. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm wondering, I don't know. It, so if you're the only regional hegemon and you're preventing yeah. anyone else right. from becoming one, that's kind of a unipolar, that's kind of global hegemony or is that different? Yeah, it's different okay. because, yeah, no. And I, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of, of so much of John's work and it's influenced my own thinking. And I think his, if I could say his, my view and his view on China and regional hegemony mm-hmm. is very close. I okay. agree with him on on everything. I mean, like the Israel-Palestine issue, I have a different different view, but like on a lot of these key, and I think his analysis has been really borne out in mm-hmm. in the, um, uh, not so much the political decision-making in Moscow, but how the war has evolved in Ukraine. Yeah. That it's basically, ter- it's more attritional. It's more about balance of forces and resolve mm-hmm. and so forth, as opposed to a kind of like, you know, maneuverist or whatever. Um, and, and also David Sachs is, you know, a big admirer of a lot of his work on a group on, on everything, the same thing, but I mean, I think a really important voice, Jeffrey Sachs, from what I, what I can tell, I, I don't have as much, hmm. uh, uh, overlap with, although I, I also don't want a war. So I guess that part, <laughs> sure. that part I agree with, but I would say, um, uh, on, on John's view, um, I think is absolutely right. And, and I agree that, that China has rational incentives for regional hegemony. 
it's standard behavior. And I think John's assessment of China mm -hmm. has done much better in predicting China's behavior over the last generation than the China specialists. Yeah. You know, if you look at what the kind of the typical China person would have predicted back 30, 40 years ago, John's assessment of this is a rising great power, much, much, much better. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's as a kind of realist, geopolitically focused. The one thing is, the roaming thing I agree with, one thing I've discussed with him before is that I, and I try to get into it a little bit in my, in my book, is I think the incentives are primarily economic. So okay. I think the work of like Robert Gilpin, who was at Princeton back in the 70s and 80s and so forth, this is important because really the, the stakes of what we're talking about are economic. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, what I think of as a secure geoeconomic sphere. Okay. Uh, rather than pure military. I mean, usually, even going back to like the pre-modern era, you know, Attila the Hun and Genghis Khan were rampaging around to extort, you know, tribute, right? Yeah. Like even barbarian. But certainly in the modern world, what country, what great powers want is like a big economic sphere, in my view, or guaranteed future economic growth and prospects. Um, but the way to get that is through military force. Okay. Because economic sanctions and other things don't work well to force countries to be in your economic mm -hmm. sphere. A classic historical example of this is Japan's stated war goals in 1941, which were to create a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which was specifically in reaction to the American attempt to embargo Japan mm -hmm. for good reason, mm -hmm. morally, not necessarily strategically, because we were trying to cut off Japan's oil and other natural resource uh, imports. Um, that's what I think China has a rational incentive for. And actually China's... Um, export-led model, Asian tiger-style model, and the fact that it's doubling down on that actually increases those incentives. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think China is almost bearing out Lenin's theory of imperialism, ironically, okay. which was that the purpose of imperialism was to develop captive markets that like, people could like, dump their advanced, manu as I understand yeah, it, yeah. advanced manufacture into and also get guaranteed resources. And that's sort of what China's doing. Like a lot of places in, for instance, in Latin America, I think have been like semi de industrial I mean, the United States yeah. has been semi de industrialized because China's taken yeah. that over. Um, so that's what um, w the reason, like I'm not, I actually thought about this in my book. I think the, the U.S. is a regional hegemon of sorts. Um, the U.S. doesn't, um, well, the, the main difference is that Asia China's area is far more important than the parts of the Western Hemisphere that is not the United States. Yeah. I mean, I think the United States would probably be like around 20 to 25%, depending on the metric of global GDP. The rest of the Western Hemisphere would probably be, certainly if you left out Canada, would be like a couple percent, okay. below 5%. Wow. So it's like very small. Yeah. You know, the Brazilian economy is fairly large, but it's, you know, it's not a, it's a lot of its natural resources and stuff. Canada is an important economy, but it's essentially like a, it's a adjacent to the United States. Like I think most of the Canadian population lives on the border with the United States, right? Like, so it's sort of almost part of our own sphere yeah. um, directly. So whereas Asia, China's like 20, 25% of GDP, but then you have India, Japan, the ASEAN countries, most of the, the largest economies in the future are gonna be in Asia, yeah. with the exception of the United States, maybe Germany um, and Brazil, maybe. Um, so that means that like, and this is a key point that I'm always kind of stressing to the Chinese, I'm not moralizing about their, you know, I'm not like- Their interests. Yeah. yeah, their interests and their desire for regional hegemony. That's how we behave, yeah. yeah, yeah. But that doesn't make it okay, like as it, or it doesn't make it, something that we are going to accept. Like, yeah. it's not like some trump card that they're like, oh, well, you have dominance over Latin America. And it's like, well, it's, well A, we're going to go after our interests. Yeah. And B, we've made mistakes and not always been right. And C, like, Asia's just a lot more important. Sure. Right? And so that's the fundamental difference. And I think um, I think that's sort of... Um, and I think that, that, that John's point, and, you know, one I share about, like, the anti-hegemonic basis mm -hmm. for American foreign policy, that is deeply rooted... If you go back to like George Kennan's sure. speech after World War II at the National Defense University, Nicholas Spikeman's work during World War II, um, but even you know even farther back, and then farther going even farther back to like British foreign policy, we in a sense kind of play a similar role, where we are trying to avoid, you know, huge portions of the world economy being under a, a dominant power. Mm -hmm. And so, what, at what um, I guess I get the question with like balance of power, yeah. stability. So like, you know, so 
I guess where I'm trying to figure out where, yeah. where the line is is because in one sense you could say, all right, so like we sort of dominate, you know, the Western Hemisphere right. economically and militarily. China dominates their hemisphere, and then whatever R- Russia and whoever dominates in the other spheres. Right. And, but clearly, like, we're uncomfortable with that. Well, it doesn't net out because the numbers don't work. That's okay. why. Like, in theory, and this is actually, there are a lot of conservatives, I think, I find, who find that idea attractive because it's like, we're going to stop these stupid wars and all that, and I'm sympathetic to that. But the problem is, like, all so much more of the economic scale and growth is yeah, concentrated it's all in Asia. There. Yeah. And that's, that's also why we got into World War One and World War Two was because if the Germans had taken over... Europe, mm-hmm. they would have dominated the European economy, which was a source of capital where we sold yeah. stuff. And by the way, once they do that, A, they can, as John points out, they can project military power beyond that. So for yeah. instance, the Chinese ships are already like going into you know, Alaskan sea and airspace and so forth. And Chinese fishing fleets are operating off the Galapagos. So it's not like if they're, if they're super strong, they're sure. not going to be like, oh, yeah, you can do whatever you want over there. We're not going to bother yeah, you. Yeah. And moreover, we are going to need to trade into and get stuff sure. from those huge economic areas. And if, if China controls it, yeah. they're going to gatekeep it. Yeah. That was what we were really doing in World War okay. II and the Cold War, I think. So, so somehow we're, we, we, we don't want to be sort of the global hegemon, right. but we also want to deny other people exactly. from becoming hegemons yeah, in their own exactly. Okay. Which is, a, I think, is both a reasonable goal, or it's a reasonable goal, it's feasible. It also aligns with the interests of many, many other countries. Okay. India does not want to be under China's thumb. Japan does not want to be under China's thumb. Philippines, Australia. So like we're working, instead of like the missionary progressivism of yeah. the unipolar era, where we're like, we're going to impose, you know, a certain form of left, you Demo- know, Fukuyama yeah. Type, yeah, yeah. type political society, whatever economy. This is more like, hey, and you can see this in the rhetoric, even today on, you mentioned social media, it's like, India. India has a different set of traditions and cultures and politics. Sure. But like, it's interesting. Um, the foreign minister, brilliant foreign minister of India, uh, uh, Jay Shankar, wrote a piece a couple months ago in the Indian press calling for Bharat, which is the, I think the term they're using in India, as far as, far as I understand. But Bharat first, mm-hmm. India first, America yeah. first. Oh, okay, you know, yeah, like yeah. yeah, here we can overlap, and here's how we can work together. And you know, you want your autonomy, even like Vietnam. I mean, communists, mm-hmm. uh, negative on communism. But we have shared interests. Sure. And, you know, and I also think in a way that's actually the best way to promote republicanism and mm-hmm. democracy anyway. Like the, the, the main reason why democratization came in this wave after the, uh, in the 1990s was, well, the Soviet Union had fallen apart. Mm-hmm. So like the most powerful country with the money yeah. and the power, <laughs> Lebowski, was a democracy. So yeah. it like tends to, so the best thing you can do for idealism is be strong and successful anyway. So it's so like overdetermined. Yeah. And it, it, what, so it, to what length should we go to prevent China from that regional hegemony? Yeah. Is there a tipping point where it's the risks of yeah. war too high and then we absolutely that hegemony? Yeah. Well, and this is something, this is like I go into like in great depth in, in my book, as I think you know, is precisely this point, which is that this is a, a very strong but nonetheless sort of relative interest. It's mm-hmm. not truly existential, like yeah. in the sense that we could survive sure. in such a world. So like there is a point, it doesn't make sense to lose like multiple American cities, you know, large cities. Yeah, to, in a nuclear you know, war to- Yeah, yeah I mean, um, a couple points. I think it's very, very important because I think American life would fundamentally change if China dominated the Asian market because it would become the globally dominant and so i think in ways that we don't appreciate Mm -hmm. we would become not just like we're not oh we're not america whatever but like the 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 global economy as a would have like this sucking sound going to yeah to asia and so for all of us who want for instance we're talking about our mutual friend ambassador bob lighthizer for another person i have great admiration for if you want to reindustrialize america Mm -hmm. forget about it yeah you know or my good friend warren cass like Forget about reindustrializing America if China dominates the global economy. Yeah. Right? So, like, it's a very important interest. So, I think we should be prepared to risk a lot, like yeah. a lot of people. I mean, not, and I say that without any, you know, interest, obviously, in that and a fear of that. Um, but I think it's a very, very important interest. Um, and in the sense, during the Cold War, nobody really knows what any president would have done if actually confronted with the situation of Soviets invading Western mm-hmm. Europe. Um, 
and I'm not sure, I don't think we want to go down exactly the path we did then, but you know, we were at least willing to credibly risk large numbers of American cities. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a probabilistic thing. Um, but um, the best policy, which I tried to go at in this book, is to not rely on having to lose a bunch of American cities, but rather to have a military that works with those militaries mm-hmm. that I talked about, like Japan, India, that are strong and or could be stronger in the case of Japan, but want to preserve their independence, to work with them, mm-hmm. which is naturally working with the warp and woof of their political intent, but also the military situation, which is, as John puts it memorably, the stopping power of water, which is a pretty intense, it's, like, yeah. it's hard to invade other people across water, or in the case of India, mountain, huge mountains mm-hmm. between China. So there's a lot of natural advantages that we can take advantage of, so that we don't have to get to that point where we're like regional hegemony or like mass national catastrophe. Yeah. That, that the whole point <laughs> of the strategy is to avoid that. Where we're seeing this like hit bone now, though, mm-hmm. is the issue of Taiwan, yeah. which I have been arguing for many years the United States should be prepared to defend mm-hmm. because it is very important. But I've always said that it is a important but not vital or existential interest, mm-hmm. like I, I often use that, like it's a 70 out of 100. Okay. And so it's it's been really important for the United States to prioritize its military, to make it more viable, to bring down the cost of defending Taiwan for the American people, to make it a winning proposition yeah. for the chief executive, um, and at the same time for the Taiwanese to do more. Unfortunately, those two things have not happened. Yeah. We have not prioritized Asia, and the Taiwanese are laggardly. Mm-hmm. And so we are heading to a situation in which we are going to face such a dilemma in a more micro context with Taiwan. But if Taiwan were to fall or capitulate or be abandoned, that would be very damaging for our anti-hegemonic cause because people would say like, well, wait a minute, why should I trust them? And the Chinese would be emboldened and all these things that we all know about that that, that the primacists always exaggerate, but which there is truth to. Sure. You know, like the issue of credibility, I go into the book, I have kind of a moderate vision of credibility. Like the primacists say everything is interconnected, and that's mm-hmm. not true. We won the Cold War after losing in Vietnam. But it's all the sort of real restrainers who say there's no such thing as credibility. That's not true, too. Yeah. Because if, you know, if, you get a, if you're going to get a mortgage, you've got to get a credit report, right? Mm-hmm. Like, of course, if you're going to put your neck out, you're going to want to judge somebody how reliable they are. So this is, this is where, but, but the solution is like, as Clausewitz says, the best solution is to be very strong. Mm-hmm. That's not what we're doing. Sure. Um, I think there is limited interest, very limited interest among the American people for raising defense spending dramatically. So I think we should act with focus. Mm-hmm. So talking about economic issues, um, the so in terms of the decoupling from China, I'm curious how this fits into this strategy. Because yeah. obviously, um, as relates to kind of key key industries that are vital for our national security or technology. Right. We obviously need that manufacturing right. base here. Right. Um, now, but it, I don't know, but it, sort of a whole scale decoupling, yeah. would that be uh, counterproductive for, yeah. you know, what you're describing militarily? So this is a great question. So, so it's what's really, I think, important in my thinking, and I, this has only been reinforced watching the sanctions against Russia, but also China and others, and also China's own sanctions. I don't think economic sanctions work very well. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a few examples, like maybe Iran in the 2010s, but it's kind of a special set of circumstances. Um, South Africa, which I also think is kind of sui generis. But generally speaking, I don't think sanctions work. They don't really work to get countries to do things they don't really want to do. Mm-hmm. Look at Russia, hasn't changed. Look at China, hasn't changed. North Korea, Vietnam was under sanctions, Cuba. Iran. Mm -hmm. Iran, The reason that the the stated reason why the administration, Bush administration, went into Iraq was because they they believed the sanctions weren't fundamentally working. Yeah. Um, I think that was a bad decision, but like that was their rationale. Uh, Also, sanctions are super porous, especially when you're dealing with like a major economy. I mean, Russia's getting a lot of things that it needs from various sources, including Europe. I mean, the Europeans are still buying like natural gas and providing through intermediaries, semiconductors and stuff. Um, and, but, the, but what's good for the goose is good for the gander. They don't work very well for us, but they also don't work very well for China. Yeah. And this is the critical point. Like China's imposed sanctions in one way or another on pretty much most of the countries in Asia. And that's caused those countries to move away from total reliance on China. Australia, Japan, even Taiwan, mm-hmm. India, 
um, Philippines. These countries have, have moved to kind of balance against China. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, what that means is um, it's sort of bad news for our sanctions mania, but it's actually good news in the sense that actually economically, the, the Chinese will have difficulty bringing us to our knees mm-hmm. uh, using economic sanctions alone because it's essentially kind of, I think it's not self-correcting, but there's like a, you know, things are moving in the right direction, mm-hmm. right? Like people understand. And the more you use those sanctions, like for instance, President Trump's warning about the role of the dollar, and the dollar is very special, but like the more, if the Chinese like cut off ibuprofen, people are going to be like, well, I guess we're going to have to get Indian. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's already been happening. Look at sure. like the Apple, more of the iPhone is being made in India, for instance. Um, so that's the, that's, that's sort of the good news. What that means is from a strategic point of view, we don't have to decouple writ large sure. to have the anti-hegemonic coalition function. If we can get the military balance right, and we can decouple those things that you really that do need, vital, like yeah. components for your weapons, you know, other things that I think is broadly agreed across the political spectrum, like pharma, you know, key pharmaceuticals or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, those kinds of things you you would want to try to uh, make sure you have your own resilient mm-hmm. supply chains. Um, I'm not against, like, on principle, like the economic point of view, like what what people are calling for to bring back. I support reindustrialization in principle. Yeah. The main caution I have is that if we are going to pursue a more intense version, we really need to be militarily focused and strong. Because mm-hmm. what I am afraid of is the 1941 repeat, which was when we put very significant oil and other natural resource sanctions on Japan because mm-hmm. of its aggressive war in China. And Japan then decided, well, they're strangling us. We need to create a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, and they're too militarily weak to stop us. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, for some period, they were correct. Mm -hmm. And what worries me is that Xi Jinping is saying that the Americans, even under the Biden administration, are trying to strangle their future economic growth. He's actually saying that. He said that directly to Biden. So my view is, like, I support tariffs. I support economic decoupling measures. But we need to be sure that we're strong militarily as we do that so the Chinese don't get the idea hey, like, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to lose access to all these markets. Mm-hmm. What's the downside to using military force? Because it's a it's a probabilistic cost-benefit calculus for Beijing. Yeah. Right? Like, they're going to be like, well, it's a cosmic roll of the dice to start a war with the Americans. But if I'm, like, getting cut off from all the advanced markets that are crucial to my future economic development, that's yeah. less bad. I, I'm going to slow strangle this way or I have a chance yeah. over here. And so that's sort of like calibrating that and sequencing them so that they're, or at least making, sh- at minimum, making sure that you have a strong military mm-hmm. shield. I think that's important for like, you know, what Senator Vance says, we don't want to be in a situation where China makes our, our stuff and we fight a war with them. We want to be in a situation where we make our own stuff and don't fight a war with them. I totally agree. Like, I just, we just need to make sure we think of how to get there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So in terms of getting there, so we, you mentioned, we talked about the national defense strategy. Yeah. yeah. Um, that you played a key role in, uh, and, you, and also I think on the, the trade and economic uh, issues that you know Lighthizer was you know led led those efforts under right. President Trump's leadership. Um, so in largely the Biden administration, I think in a, in a way that's been much weaker, but yeah. they've largely kept yeah. with this playbook, right? right? So what needs to happen over the next five to ten years to get where we need to be vis-a-vis China? You mean on the on the decoupling issue? Oh, well, not a, well, I guess the well or the, the combination, the, the military, combination. and yeah. why? Because you, you said we're not there yet. You know, we need to be the pivot to Asia needs to be. Well, I harder. think that yeah. yeah. I mean, I think denial is the standard, which is we don't need to like march to Beijing. You need to get um, the the military forces in the right place at the right time. That even if they were surprised, they could defeat a Chinese and de- determine mm-hmm. Chinese invasion. Ideally, of Taiwan, if Taiwan proves to laggardly and not to take its own defense seriously and we don't focus enough, then we would have to draw the perimeter behind that, but that would be very bad. Um, but I think I think that's, you know, that's mostly about, and then if we're in that situation, then I think we're in a position, you know, as old high school times, we're in the catbird seat, you know, like you, you can put the economic sanctions in, the, in that position because the Chinese don't have a military option. Yeah. The problem is the Biden administration has left us in a very bad position. There are some good things happening in terms of our posture in Asia and some engagement with Taiwan and so forth. But on the whole, they've run down our stockpiles. Mm -hmm. They've not fixed our defense industrial base. They're not 
increasing defense spending, which seems kind of hard to envision anyway, um, or at least dramatic. Hopefully some increases are possible. But this, you know, in a sense, they're going to leave the next administration. I hope it's President Trump is getting it, of course, and Senator Vance. But they're going to leave us way out of position with a losing war in Ukraine. It's not mm-hmm. going well. With ongoing wars in the Middle East and with the Houthis and so forth. And then, you know, North Korea is up. And then this counter coalition is increasingly cohesive. So to me, one of the great things about what's so important, going back to the system and the establishment and so forth, is people ask, like, what does Vice President Harris, what does her administration look like? I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't think anybody can reasonably say, mm-hmm. "Oh, here's a clear agenda." Sure. There hasn't, no, none has been presented that's credible. What I think of her representing is like the kind of the system continuing the current course, probably like even more to the left, mm-hmm. which is like huge, high, high, high stated goals of like democracy versus autocracy. We'll defend, we'll defend the rules based international order. All this stuff, not backed up. By anything. By yeah. really like anything close to what's needed and an increasingly adversarial counter coalition. Like I think that's just putting us the ship right into the iceberg. Yeah. Because, I mean, don't take it from me, the Democratic Secretary of the Air Force says the Chinese are preparing for war. And so, you know, so what we need is a willingness to buck the system, buck yeah. Morning Joe. I thought one of the most illuminating points of like news on on the Biden administration was that like President Biden like religiously watches Morning Joe and reads Tom Friedman and stuff. It's hmm. like it's like it's the Overton window for what's po- like I bet if you gave like Jake Sullivan a uh, a uh, uh, lie, you know a truth serum he'd be like oh yeah they're going to have to negotiate. It, they're openly leaking to the Wall Street Journal today or yesterday. That they think that the Ukraine, Ukrainian victory plan is a joke, basically. Yeah. I mean, that's like what they said. And so it's like the individuals who are working in certain important parts, they might, if they had their druthers, come up with a more sa- a sane and sensible policy. But they don't have that power because the Overton window doesn't, is not it's, there. It, it, and yeah. there's, they're hostage to the, this left elite Overton window. Yeah. And like President Trump, Senator Vance, they're like, Totally okay with not being in that, which is like what America needs. Yeah. And frankly, what our allies need too, because the people who are going to pay the price, are hopefully not too much the Americans, but really like these frontline allied states mm-hmm. that are betting on something that we're not going to follow through on. Yeah. Like, and that's, that's bad. So what we need, when people say Trump proofing, I'm like, well, he's doing you a favor yeah. <laughs> because that's much more realistic. Yeah. So that blob kind of mentality that would keep someone like even a, a Jake Sullivan yeah. from being able to say or, or do what he might, you know, actually think. Who knows? Yeah, what who he knows? Um, so I, I am wondering like how, you know, it's almost like any time there's any um, potential conflict or any conflict yeah. erupting anywhere in the world, right. one of the first things I see or I get a news <laughs> alert on my phone is that like ships, American yeah. ships are on the move, you yeah. know, and it's even before probably the president can deliberate on this, even before, <laughs> yeah. it's like the ships just go yeah, there. It's like a spasm. Um, yeah. it's, it's like, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe in some cases the ships should go there. I, I don't know. But like, um, so, you know, one thing that I fear is like, um, you know, and, and I'm hopeful that, that, that President Trump and Senator Vance would do better, you know, in yeah. terms of getting reining in this kind of uh, the blob, right? Right. But how do we? Um, I don't know. It just seems like it's yeah. on autopilot. I know. So how do you? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, deep I program. Remember, uh, so showing my deep liberal arts education, I have to remember the movie uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, where he's okay. teaching yeah. him how to uh, surf, and he's yeah. like, "Do less, do less." You know, that's all of my like to the Amer- to the whole like national security enterprise. Like, do do less, right? Yeah. Like, you're gonna we're gonna do better if we do a bit less. And um, a couple points on that. I mean, one is I don't think we can do that. Like we already know, and there was an article yesterday in like the Defense News or something about how we're spending a bunch of money and running down our readiness in the Middle East and Europe relative to Asia. Meantime, China's in this historic buildup. So we actually know that. And the the stated defense strategy of the country under two administrations is saying we can't afford to do so much. Mm -hmm. And yet it it keeps going. Why? Again, because of that Overton window, because like, yeah, maybe the under secretary of whatever the assistant secretary says we can't do this but like meanwhile up up where it really matters they're still in the like unipolar era and mm-hmm. what what would joe scarborough think or richard haas or whatever um so i think that's that's really important the other thing is it's not even working mm-hmm. that's the kind of surreal thing like the houthis for instance yeah, yeah. blown like years worth of key munitions 
firing at the Houthis and they're still attacking shipping. Yeah. So it's like, why people are like, oh, we have to do this thing. It's like, well, A, no, we don't. We could actually be more strategic. Yeah. And, and kind of operationally restrained, not like as a principle, but just like, hey, like we can't afford to do that. So, and but B, it doesn't even work. Yeah. So why why are it's like it's spasmodic. It's like it's some kind of like ghost limb. Um, and you know the other thing is like historically, if you look at the operations of what we call the joint force, you know, basically the the, the military as a whole, it was much less active during mm-hmm. the Cold War. Um, I mean, we did employ it for various things, but it's become a lot more active since the end of the Cold War, consistent with a different model of what we were trying to do. During the Cold War, the primary goal was containment. Mm -hmm. Like the rules-based, people don't really talk about the rules-based international order. That's like a neologism that's come up in the last decade or so out of academia. During the Cold War, the main thing was containment. Now, there were different views of containment. There were more maximalist views like Paul Nitze in NSC 68. I personally am more in the line of President Eisenhower, which was like a more focused vision, kind of, I would say, a little bit more realistic vision of containment. But that was the debate. Now it's like we're the Pax Americana. Like that, that, Pax Americana was not how we thought, like actually used our military during the, the yeah. Cold War. And so I think we could go back to that and, and get better. And then, I, you know, and, and I think the, the, the core to solving that, again, is at the presidential level mm-hmm. and like the level of the secretary of defense and who the president thinks is the secretary of defense and what kind of guidance. And the fact is we know President Trump, for instance, has tried to get our troops out of Iraq and, and uh, Syria, which to me makes sense. Like, I don't Why are they there? It seems like a kind of what the, they call in the bureaucracy, a self-licking ice cream cone, Yeah, which is... And then, like, we're constantly worried that they're going to get attacked because they're vulnerable out there, you know, in the, in the Wild West. And I'm like, well, what's the point? And by the way, we won the Cold War and Iraq and Syria weren't on our side. So it can't be that vital yeah. in the end, of, the end of the, you know. Sure. So it's like, I'm not saying we just don't do anything in the Middle East. I'm just saying, like, hey, you know, by the way, in the, middle, in the Cold War, we had very limited forces, even arrayed in the Middle East, let mm-hmm. alone stationed on on territory. I mean, that was something that happened really only after the fall of the Shah. So like, again, this gets back to this kind of history, but I, I think if you have, and you know, people who have this set of ideas, you can clearly, I think President Trump and Senator Vance are aware of these kinds of things and they've got the right basic, uh, you know, approach, then I think we could actually solve it before. But I think if we continue on our current trajectory, especially given the assessments of what the Chinese are doing, I think I, th- I mean, honestly, I think we risk, we do risk World War III, and mm. we could lose it. Hmm. I mean, yeah, I scary thought, but yeah. Um, yeah, grateful for your for your work on developing this strategy. Final question is yeah. more practical in nature. Um, we obviously have a lot, you know, college students across the country that are will be watching this show. Maybe two questions. Uh, one is just kind of you know career advice yeah. for young people wanting to go into the national security space. Mm-hmm. Um, is that law degree that you got sort of necessary or not? And then also, um, are there any specific books, kind of foundational texts, um, either works of history or yeah. theory that you think are worth reading? Yeah. Um, so on the national security world, I, kind of practical advice is if you're interested in it, don't, don't give up. It's hard to break in. Mm-hmm. But once you've kind of found a way in, you know, you can, you can navigate. But I mean, I think... Um, you know, don't don't get dis- don't get discouraged, and I think <clears throat> it's going to be a very important field, unfortunately, in this coming generation, uh, or at least the coming years. Uh, so I think it is certainly rewarding from a kind of I'm uh, getting up in the morning mm-hmm. and feeling like you're doing something perspective. Um, I would say that also, um, you know, it's it's totally understandable and and realistic to assume that people would go gravitate towards the traditional branded institutions and figures within the Congress and so forth. But I think that this sort of more reform, you know, more realistic view of um, of what, you know, conservatives and Republicans and so forth are, their approach to foreign policy is in the ascendancy. Mm-hmm. And I think there's sort of like a, you know, often a, 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 an entrenched elite is able to hold on for a long time. And you see that with some of the other uh, kind of big name institutions on the right where their foreign policy is wildly out of step, I would say with reality, but also with where, you know, clearly the, the, the momentum in the party is. And, and I think I mentioned the Wall Street Journal op-ed page. Uh, 
or you know some of those very senior members of Congress who are from a different era. I'm not saying they're bad or I disagree with them on everything. I agree with them on, on a number of things. Many of them are wonderful people. But I think you know don't you know don't 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 join a, a put your future um, in a a cause that I think is is really manifestly not suited for our time mm -hmm. and is and I you know I think people will look for younger people who. Um, you know, who are willing to see where things are going and, and willing to kind of put their, their shoulder into it. And I think that that's the best way to serve the country. And you can see Senator Vance, a perfect example, you know, or Senator Hawley, Senator, uh, well, hopefully Senator Banks, Senator Schmidt, Senator Lee, some of these other, you know, again, people with different views sure. and, and all kinds of different things, but representing an approach that I think is much closer to what the country needs and where people are. And, that, and that's going to be the exciting place to be rather than being like, the last guy on the Titanic and as it's yeah. sinking below this, you know, like just let's get on the, get on the, get on the airplane rather than the ocean liner. Um, so that'd be my advice um, on that. And I think Washington tends to be, and the government functionally tends to be uh, reward graduate degrees of some kind. Um, the, the law degree in the old days, people would kind of uh, toggle back and forth. So it can be a, a good career, but um you know, really depends on your on your personality and so forth. But um, you know, especially for people who want to have more of a, um, uh, I guess something I would say is I think one thing that I try to do without being self referential is unorthodox and sort of a, a heretic, if you will. But um, but also uh, maybe not a heretic. Actually, would be better. It would be like a reformer, but not like cast out completely, yeah. so that you be because one thing that can happen to people who are trying to change things is you become is essentially marginalized. Um, and this is not good for yourself, but it's also not good for the cause. Yeah. Um, and I think what we need are people who want to drive change, but it can actually have that effect. Yeah. Right? There, there are some academics, um, realist academics, for instance, who I, you know, I kind of, I'm like, the way I put it is, um, Hey, you know, uh, uh, it, politics is reality. It's okay to be political. Yeah. Right. So kind of see where you're, you know, how far you can go, and make sure you've got your, you know, your your ducks in a row in terms of your credentials or whatever. And that's not everything, but you know, credentials are sort of a means to an end. Sure. And I think that's important. And the way you kind of comport yourself on social media, that would be my advice as well. Like, don't make it easy for some of the the old guard to 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 push you aside because you're, you know. And maybe that's a different culture in the, in the next generation. It seems like people are much more, you know, in the fray. But, but that would be kind of my advice. Great. We'll end there. Thanks All for right. joining. Thank you.